You're tuned into Cine Hustle, and I'm your host, Vin Chandra. Welcome to the Sydney Hustle Podcast. I'm your host, Vin Chandra, and today my guest is writer and director and educator, Matt Conan, live from LA. Now, you have directed uh, two features, which are available on Prime, and you've had uh, directed and DP'd multiple shorts and multiple commercials, so you're living the life of a Sydney Hustler. And I wanted to, you know, talk to you, pick your brain, and ask you questions about how you got started in the filmmaking industry, and how did you get where you are? Well, uh, it's a long and, and crazy route sometimes. So I ended up going to grad school for, uh, for filmmaking at USC after getting in, which was a surprise to everybody involved, including me. And, uh, and then from there, it's just, it's been sort of kicking around and you, it, you know, there's a, there's a thing you do when you first get out here, when you first get into the industry, you're trying to, you're trying to get into the film industry. And some people succeed at that. Some people don't early on. If you don't, you're kicking around the bottom of the industry for a long time. And you eventually, if you're smart, realize that no one's going to do anything for you until you do it for yourself. I mean, the reality that I have learned is that work begets work. Whatever you're doing, if it's something interesting, people see you as doing something. And then they're more inclined to to be interested in what you're doing. They're more inclined to ask you about the next thing you're doing. There's a lot of people who just say they have the one thing they're working on and that's their only thing. And they're waiting for someone else to give them money for it. They're waiting for someone else to give them a chance. It's not going to happen um, for the most part. Most most times you have to prove yourself first. That, that's actually su- such a great point because you know no one's going to give you the work. And like you just said, you have to be out there hustling. And that's you know something that I mean I've seen you do. And did you start off as a cinematographer first or were you a, um, did you start off in directing? No, I was mostly, a, I started off mostly writing and directing. I did that in theater at UC Irvine. And then when I went to grad school, I focused on cinematography mainly because I saw that as my weak spot uh, hmm. where I didn't know anything and ended up liking it a lot. And because I didn't have a lot of money, like so many of my fellow USC comrades, I ended up shooting their thesis films instead of making my own as a director. So I, I wrote a thesis script and I shot a lot of their stuff uh, because that was a way for me to get better looking stuff and do more that I didn't have to pay for because I couldn't afford to to make. At the time, we were shooting either on film or on really crappy video, and I just couldn't afford it. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I was able to get uh, a decent amount of work that way with with my fellows, and then uh, kind of just kept doing it on and off. Do you think that's made you a more of a well rounded um, filmmaker? The fact that you start, you know, that you saw cinematography as your weakness because. I mean, just as a side note, I've worked with you so many times in cinematography is de- definitely not your weakness, man. I mean, uh, you know, there's so much stuff I've learned off you, which, which has really upped my game. But did, uh, did that in turn make you a, a better, well-rounded filmmaker when you had to learn uh, the cinematography aspects of it? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think any time you are looking at a craft and its totality and trying to see where you fit in and where your weak spots are. And that's a good general rule for life, I find. If you have weak spots in something you want to do, address them, attack them directly. There's no reason not to. Uh, as far as cinematography and making a better filmmaker, I mean, of course, it's one of the primary aspects of filmmaking is the the visual component of it. I think the more you, it may it not doesn't make you a better filmmaker, it makes you a better writer, it makes you a better director, because all the things that we do, if you're, if you're, used to thinking visually you stop thinking in terms of just talking and in terms of just dialogue and you're able to do things you realize that you wouldn't otherwise have done you would have done through dialogue or through exposition that you realize no i don't need to do that i can write that in a different way and visually it plays right right so you know i wanted to ask you you've directed two feature films you've written and directed two feature films one uh has got multiple names ah zombies or zombies need love too or wasting away which one was the original name for that film Actually, it's only the two. It's uh, zombies, zombies, zombies are people too. Is the tagline? Okay. Um, but it was originally wasting away. Uh-huh. Uh, that was its original release. We when we switched distributors because our first one was terrible. Uh-huh. The uh, new distributors wanted us to change the name, and their their preference was for a name. And this is this is where you realize then this is where you start to see the how movies are actually distributed and the nuts and bolts of it, which is annoying but true. Uh, they they wanted to change the name, but they wanted us to make a name that would be high up in the net in the order when it came to say apple tv or wherever huh. so so we had something started with an a and multiple a's was even better so that was where uh, zombies came oh my goodness that's so funny because i have that film on my itunes catalog i i buy films on itunes right 
And that is the first film that comes on that every time you go to my library, that Ah Zombies is the first film. That ain't, that, that ain't no accident. Oh, no, dude, that's, that's genius. I never thought of that, but, you know, you've given me some tips. So, here, for anybody out there that wants to get their top listing, start with a name. <laughs> start, with, start with the name that goes AA, you know, or A. I don't know. That's, that's or, great. Or, or, or a number. Or, or a number. number. Okay. Num- yep. Numbers come first in, the, in that category, too. Actually, no. On my iTunes catalog, like 28 days later, oh, really? which is, you know, yeah. it's actually at the bottom. So, oh, they must have changed it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, then. cool. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? Uh, now that you've, you've opened my eyes already. Wow. That's an that's <laughs> awesome bit of information right there. So, you, you know. So, you so really, are we going to see the Aardvark series now by Vin Chung? <laughs> You know what? That's, that's it. I would have to give you writing credit for that. You know, <laughs> the hard fart series. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you wrote uh, Zombies. Co-wrote with my brother. Co-wrote with your brother. Yes. Yeah. Sean, and, and also with uh, The Funeral Guest, which I also have yes, in my catalog. Yeah. Um, how, how did you go about, and, 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 you know, they were both made in two different times. So, uh, Zombies was made in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And um, Funeral Guest was made, you know, two, three years ago? Yeah. And so, in, in your, how has, has the process of getting that film uh, produced from like writing it, uh, getting it financed, and then to completion and then distribution, has that changed in the last 10 years, whatever it was? Yeah, it has. Some th- things have changed for the better and some for the worse. The stuff uh-huh. that's changed for the better are the production processes and that like the cameras you can get now uh, are so much better than what we had at the time for less like we had to for wasting away we had to get we had to rent a viper which was a which was the same camera that they shot collateral on but it was like hmm. a newer it was newer when it came to digital cameras but it but it was it was also one of the it was one of the better ones around but it had to, it had to be tethered to a tape deck we had to buy very expensive hd cam tape it was expensive to rent the the the, uh, the size of the chip was was not nearly a uh, full 35 millimeter size so the depth of field was wrong and the lenses and it was it was very different that way and then the post process was a real pain in the ass because you needed because anytime you had to go back and forth those tapes you had to rent an hd cam tape was like a thousand dollars a day just to rent that thing just to get to your footage right so it became so those sort of things became a lot harder to do the the simple effects that we had to do on that i could do on my own computer now Hmm, Um, at the the time at the time we partnered with an effects company and they helped us do that uh, as part of it but it was so those things are a little bit are a lot easier now what's harder I think is more of the distribution and the fact that the because so much stuff is easier, the pipeline is clogged and it makes it very hard to get your stuff seen uh, unless you have names or 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 some some other way, some other marketing way of getting it out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that means that either you have to cut your top, cut your margins for the top and make the movie for less so you don't have to make as much or you have to cast people that will that will be seen because right. it's hard to get the kind of deal you used to get on distribution in the current day because there's so much stuff out there. You right. know, Prime doesn't pay that much. Right. You know. And Netflix Netflix when they do negative pickups are meh, all their stuff nowadays is is pretty much internal and that's hard to get because they like big names. Right, right. So pretty much I mean uh, what was that what was it, the recent thing that I heard was that a lot of filmmakers now are grateful that Netflix is around because Netflix is what's employing everybody because they're making the stuff internally and they're literally you know producing by the numbers but a lot of the actors are getting jobs just off netflix and now prime studios which is opening near you right culver city yeah yeah i wouldn't even i mean i wouldn't even say just netflix and prime i mean the streaming services have have opened up the world for so much stuff you have you have apple tv now you have you have Prime, you have Hulu. You mean you have everybody is doing original original content on TV, especially. I mean, for God's sake, the Weather Channel is doing original content. <laughs> right, it's just, right. It, yeah, it's true. It becomes a point where there's so much that's getting done. The hard part is trying to rise above it, and the margins are smaller. That doesn't make it bad. It means that more people have the opportunity, but getting into that is still difficult because you still have to prove to people you can do it, and that's the hard part about doing this sort of thing is that the only way to prove you can do a feature or a TV show in most people's eyes is to do a feature or TV show. Mm. Uh, and that's so, so it's this catch 22 of having to get that done one way or the other by hook or by crook. And that's right. sort of the, the, the gist of all this is that you, there's a lot of ways to do it. There's no one way to do it right. There's a lot of ways to do it wrong. Right. But at the end of the day, you just got to get it in the can and, and nobody cares how hard it was. Right. It either works or it doesn't. So for you, do you think that making a movie on the cheap, even if it's a feature film on the cheap, is much better in, in today's climate for a budding filmmaker? Absolutely. I mean, the tools are all there. I mean, I, I can make, 
if you if you have a little bit of ability, if you can study a little bit, try a few things out. Like you can take a camera that you can buy. I mean, I mean, let me look at like Tangerine was made with an iPhone. Now right. I, everyone says like, oh, that was you just run around with your phone. It's not that simple. No, it yeah. was an iPhone. It was an iPhone capture device with many attachments on it, and right. people who knew what they were doing, and a great sound person to capture sound. Exactly. That doesn't mean, however, that the ability to do that isn't there. Right. So it just comes down to story and performance. Right. And that's exactly my previous podcast, Dave Horowitz. I know you've worked with him too um, in commercial projects. You know, I had Dave on the previous show and he said that it literally comes down to script and performance. And that's where his film, uh, with with a few other issues, that's where his film had failed. But I mean... You know, in today's filmmaking climate, that I feel like that a movie like something that Dave did years ago could be made so so easily now and so much better. You know, even if even if he tweaks the script a bit. So you know, I mean, I'm trying to push him to make something just to have something made, and that's exactly sure. what I'm. That's exactly what I'm doing. You know, I'm I've spoken to you about this. You know, I'm trying to do a film in Fiji. And um, we've come a, a long way, but, you know, right now we're still honing that script because I've had a few scripts sent out to me, a few uh, stories and stuff like that. And we started to tweak it out and make, make it what we want to make it, you know. And that's something that I've learned from you as well is getting that script down. Yeah. Because uh, you being a writer, that's one of the first things that you've told me when I've sat with you and talked to you about filmmaking is script, 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 and then performance, you know. Um, everything else is pretty much uh, ancillary. Yeah. And so, with, with these features, for zombies, and then with funeral guests, mm-hmm. you you and your brother wrote these uh, wrote these films. And how did you how did how did you get it financed? What was the process that you did? Because I mean, especially in a time like uh, when you made zombies, was it more difficult to get financing during that time, or was it more difficult this the second time around in, for funeral guests? You know, they were both just different. Um, both of them were were funded by individuals who we had worked with prior. Who, who said they wanted to invest. And, and this is what I mean by work begets work, is that we had already done decent work for them in other ways, either cinematographers, editors, just written something for them. And so what they were investing in was less the movie and more us. Right. And that's where you realize that it's, it's when they say, oh, it's all who you know, it's not a luck thing because you can know everybody in the world. Right. But if they don't like you, it doesn't matter. If they don't think that you're, you're like, there's all this... I, I, you always see guys around who are, who are like the, Hey, Hey guys. And they go to all the parties and they know all the people, <laughs> but they don't have, but this, but you're like, well, if you know everybody, why aren't you getting directing jobs? Just because yeah. no one's going to, no one's going to throw, you know, throw $5 million at someone when they think, Oh, he's a cool dude, but I mean, what's he got? Now what's he done? Right. And at some point you have to actually show that you can do it. You have to actually give them something to work with. And so in, in all cases, the funeral guest is probably a more illustrative thing in that we had we had worked with some. We had because that, that actually spun sort of slowly out of um, out of wasting away. On wasting away, there was an actor that we cast who was eh, so so. He was one of the minor roles, but he was he was a super confident, over the top confident guy. Mm-hmm. Um, came out of came out of Michigan. We we got along with him because we found him funny and kind of cool. But he it, it wasn't a great actor. But it was it was fine. He was he he did the job fine. And, but but he really wanted to get into producing movies too. And he came from Michigan. He came from Michigan, and he knew these guys who had a lot of money. Uh, and they were all interested in film, but they were mainly in real estate. One of them was out here, uh, and and he was pursuing real estate for his family and also trying to make short films. And so we took, we met with him and we talked about stuff. Nothing really jived there, but eventually we ended up meeting his his brother Nick, who is who we would eventually make funeral guest with. And uh, and Sean had written a short that Nick wanted to produce. Nick played uh, American football in Italy professionally. Uh, which is, which is, yeah, it's cool. It's cool, but it's also, it's also like you're playing in a, in you know, Division three football in college. He, he's and he's a good quarterback, but it's a very, it's a very different thing out there. But he had, he was out there, and he wanted to produce a short film just because he wanted to do that. So he did that. He took this short film, which is about six or seven pages, and he went with this Italian director, and they made the movie. And then he comes back to us about a month later and shows us a cut and says, "What do you think?" And we watch this thing. It's about fifteen minutes long off of a seven minute, seven seven page script. It's a lot of long shots of this hot Italian girl. And it's just, it's kind of dull. It's decent. It looks good, but it's like, this is just dull. Maybe if you cut, if you cut the, like cut it in half, it'll be good. And so he takes the notes that we do. We go and he goes back to the director and they have this big fight. And the director is like, oh, it's my style. It's a cut, it's a. And so he wouldn't <laughs> do it. And so Nick took the movie away from him uh, and said, fine, I paid for it. I'm going to recut it. But they had a fight so that the director wouldn't give him the footage. So all he had was the existing the existing 1080 that he had that they had made, and he said, "Can you guys help me with this at all?" And we said, "Okay." So we took it and and using only the existing footage, we cut it down. Um, 
made it into a, a workable story, remixed it, got music on it, colored it, and then said, here you go. And he liked it, and he got into festivals, and he was really happy with it. And he said, hey, let's do some more shorts. And we said, well, we're not really interested in shorts on their own, because you know, we're trying to do features. He's like, well, you, how about a feature? What do you got? We didn't have anything at that point. We said, well, we're working on something. We'll get back to you in about a month, having nothing. Um, so we, we sat down and said, okay, let's we have a couple ideas. What can we do? Because uh, we knew a couple things. We knew it had to be mainly character driven. We knew we wanted to use Juliana, who is who is in Gracing Away and who is is our lead. This is fantastic. Yeah. So we wrote it basically around that, and we wrote it. We wrote, wrote the funeral guest, and he liked it. We made tweaks, and they finally said, "Okay, let's let's do this." And what do you need? Like, well, I guess we can make it for three hundred thirty thousand, maybe with uh, with incentives in uh, with incentives in uh, in Michigan. And they went back to the company. And they talked back and forth. And they said, "Sure." And that was that. There were some restrictions, but mostly that was it. But it came out of this idea that that we had done free stuff for them first that was good. Right. Just because we were like, yeah, we, we want to do good work and we don't really care so much about the money. You don't have to pay us that much. And then they said, okay, well, let's try something different. And they end up, you know, they really liked the movie. And, you know, that's, that's, that's how it all works sometimes. So how, this is something that I think a lot of filmmakers need to learn too, and maybe you can help shed light on this, is how do you go by... I mean, when you, when you approach financiers like that, I mean, because I've been I've been approaching financiers in a sense of, you know, hey, this is not an investment. I don't know if I can guarantee you a return on your on your money, but you know, I mean, it, I, that my thing is I can't get past it. I've been told no, you got to try to sell it and make sure these people going to get money. But you, a, a film is a gamble to me. You can't do that. Making a film, yeah, I can't. I, I would, it's actually it's actually technically fraud to say they're definitely going to get their money back, but no one should sell an investment like that. Right. So, how do you sell? How do you sell an investment, or how do you sell a financial backing, or how do you how do you approach people about saying, "Hey," and I mean, I think you you've answered that question by saying that um, these people trust you and they've worked with you before and they want to like back your art. That's the main thing. They're, they're investing in you. They they have to trust you as to a certain extent. As far as the investment, you know, you're 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 basically do you, you do your best to say here are the ways we will mitigate risk. Here are the things we can we can do when it comes to incentivized jurisdictions. Um, you know, small. You know, uh, making sure that we that we have a have a, a script that is is contained in a, in a in a small space, so the budget is limited for what we get out of it. We try to keep it commercial and interesting, but at the same time, it's like, look, every investment is inherently risky. Uh, movies are no different. If you're interested in investing in movies, here's what it is. If you're not, then then you're not, and then good day to you. But uh, but it but it isn't. A, but it, but you can't. You, certainly, you can't lie. That's obviously no good for so many reasons. But you really have to just pitch them on the idea that what you're what what they're they're investing in has value to it, in a way that is beyond you know that that is that is is long term and is different. Like it has ongoing value. It's if it's if it's done well, and you have to again, you have to make it clear that the goal here is to say. How do we mitigate the risk? How do we, you know, everything's, you know, you buy, you buy real estate and it could, it could fall into a sinkhole. It's less likely, but it's true. And so, the, so you have to, you have to go, well, look, this is cost less than this, but it has, it has high upside potential. There are movies that have done really well. Here are some of them. Uh, they all, you know, there's no guarantee of any of this, but we will do everything we can to mitigate the risk. That, that means a smaller initial investment because we don't have to spend a lot because it's a single right. location thriller or because we're, because we're going to get, we're going to, you know, get a name, this person we have attachment to, whatever. There's no one way to do it. I mean, you just have to, so it, it comes down to recognizing that your job as a filmmaker and as a, as a producer is to convince them that there is, there is value here for them. Um, and a lot of that does come from having something to show otherwise it says, look, we've made this, it's made some, made some money, but even so, like we don't, you know, nothing we've done has broken the bank. So we can't necessarily say, oh, if you invest in us, you know, it's like, it's going to be, it's going to be like, you know, Oren Pelly when he made paranormal activity, it's going to be huge. Like, no. And he, cause even that is cause that, 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 that movie was in, in scream fest with us, with us when we did wasting away. And it was, it was fine. It didn't blow, blow blow the world off. In fact, we won the audience award that same year over them. And but but um, DreamWorks saw potential in it. They picked it up, um, and then and they finished it with about one hundred fifty thousand dollars because they still had to finish the ending and do the sound. So it's not as simple as oh, you made it for sixty thousand. Like nah, it's not quite. They still had to you know it, it was still a movie that they saw some different potential in that was uh, that was a different kind of movie. And I think that's the kind of thing you have to be able to sell them is the idea that well, there's something different about this, and it's going to be it's going to be unique in in its in the space that it is, or it falls within existing realities that we know are going to be good, and here's why 
these things have made money. You just have to do your homework and make sure that they're aware that movies of a similar type can make money and how do we mitigate the risk? Like you're th- if you're thinking about Fiji, well, Fiji has incentives. How much? If, if, they, if they invest a certain amount, can you monetize those? Can you quickly monetize those incentives and give them back to them to mitigate their risk by 20% already? Mm. So whatever they've invested is already a 20% return, no matter what, so that their $400,000 investment is, is now, is now you know, a, a $320,000 investment and it's not as big a deal for them because right away they're taking money back. There are there you have to you have to emphasize things like the tax issues. There the, the the tax code includes the allowances to to write off filmmaking uh, costs for a long time. So it is there are things that can be done, but you have to know you have to do some of that research and know what what how to speak their language in the terms of both be interested in the art of it, but at the same time recognize it is still money and they don't want to lose it. And that's always been my fear is that like when you're when you're trying to ask somebody to finance your film, you know, that you, it it is it is kind of literally, you know, that that's always a fear is I don't want people to lose their money. You know, so because you always want to make something that that you want to be a success. So I think getting past that initial um that's your issue. I mean, you is that's the, you can also make a shitty movie. You just got to get over it. I mean, right. You got to right. assume at some point in time that you can do this because uh-huh. if not, you should do something else. Right, because it's not easy. Absolutely, I'm not saying you. I'm saying your listeners. Yeah, I'm sure no, you're, I, you're but that, but that's so, that, that's so true. At, at some point, you have to be doing good good work. If you're not doing good work, that's you know, even in smaller like commercial stuff, you know, I mean, yeah, you get better at it the way that you were doing, where you say, "I'm interested in this," right, and then you start working with people and you start asking questions. And then you know, one thing I've never, one thing I've never said that you were is shy about asking questions, which is mm-hmm. good. You should always be willing to say, hey, I don't know how to do this. Tell me what you're doing. Let me talk me through it. And most good filmmakers are happy to, or good good craftsmen are happy to talk about their craft as long as it's not in the, in the way of things. No one begrudge it. Like, we all remember when we didn't know how to do this stuff. Right. And, and usually there was someone who did the same for us. Not always, but usually. And so you want to say, okay, this person wants to know. They're, they're willing to ask. They're working hard. Yeah, we'll talk you through it. You know, you can't pester them in the middle of the shoot all the time, but you can ask a few questions here and there and see how it goes. Absolutely. You know, but you have to recognize what you're asking for. Don't don't ask people to read to big things. Like reading a script is a big deal. It's a it's you know, feature script is two hours of my life. Most and and no matter, I don't care who you are. For the most part, ninety percent of them terrible. Right. I used to read scripts <laughs> for a living. That's no bag on people. It's hard to write good stuff. Most of it's not good. It's just, you know, if, if, if it was all good, then everyone would get, would get scripts, but it's not. Right. So we have to, you have to recognize that you're, you know, don't give out things that are, that are not ready. Like don't give out works in progress. Don't ever show some, something to somebody. If you don't think like if you, if it's your first draft, you are not ready. I don't care who you are. You're not ready. Huh. That's, that's good to know. Cause I, I always get like people that are, that are sending me outlines and first drafts and so they're, they're just impatient. Right. Okay. You got to show it to people who you don't give it, show it to friends you trust hmm. who will give you a real opinion. And then, and if they, if they don't come back to you and go, dude, that was awesome. Hmm. It's not ready. Right. Not, not yet. If they say, yeah, it was good. Bullshit. So I try to distinguish what makes a good idea and what makes a bad idea. So I'm always, you know, that's something that I do a lot is I always ask people, Hey, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of this idea? Do, sure. do you think at that point, um, where do you draw the line in saying, okay, what about this idea? Is it just that, Hey, maybe I can send you a log line and just an outline or maybe depends or, on what the intent is. Right. If you're asking friends what they think is interesting, you know, do it as long as they do as much as they'll, they'll take. Right. If you're talking to people who actually have the power to give you money or other stuff, no, you give them you give them the one thing that is 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 excellent and it's ready to go. Even if you're saying it's a work in progress, doesn't matter. You want to say it's a work in progress because they want to think they have input on it, which is fine. But it's not. It is as ready as you think you can get it. Because otherwise, they're going to look at it. And they're going to go, "Oh, you think this is good?" And it's not. And keep in mind, most most civilians can't read scripts very well. Like they don't get how it works. So you have to tweak your script a little bit beyond what it might be. It has to become a little bit more readable. Um, so there's, there's drafts you may do, you know, the draft you shoot is not the draft you, you sell. Hmm. You know, it's, it's funny because I'm learning so much more just, just off what you're saying right now. That is so true because I mean, a lot of these guys are getting pitched all the time and they, no one has time for, for things anymore, let alone a shitty script. Right. 
So, and one thing I wanted to get back to, um, around to is um, you talked about making, if, if you want, if you want to make features, you need to make features, you know, just get stuff under your belt. So how do you feel about making short films? I mean, I think they're great. It's not that you can only make features. If you make a bunch of good shorts that do really well, and then you have features, mm -hmm. feature scripts that are interesting, that's helpful. I know it's hard to make a feature all the time. It's not the only way to do it. But recognize that if you do that, if you're using shorts as your, your go-to, you have to be able to, if someone says, hey, that's interesting, you have to be able to have a, fe a feature script that is great. Mm -hmm. Whether you wrote it, whether you bought it, whatever, you have options, doesn't matter. That is, is small enough that's viable within you. Don't, don't say, hey, I have this great superhero franchise. You know, shut up. You're, you're an idiot. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in terms of the rest of it, like you have to be able to say, uh, I have a script that's really good. It's in the same sort of vein of the kind of shorts that I've made. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's under a million dollars, and we can make it tomorrow if you're in. And then you have, then, and then you have the ability, again, you have to be confident enough to say that we can start this right away. I own the script outright. I either wrote it or it was optioned by me. It's like this. I, you know, you may have a lookbook ready to go. Recognize right. that you have to present the people that you're ready to go tomorrow. They're not ready to go tomorrow, but you have to show that you have thought about this. Because otherwise, they're going to wonder, well, wait a minute, how much, you know, the first thing you're going to see, that, that most people don't get what it is, you know? Like you, like if I get, you know, you look at a script, it's like, that doesn't tell you what it's going to be movie wise. That tells you what the words on the page are. Right. So. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you're packaging in your, it, it, it's being ultimately prepared one to have a good script and two sell that film and sell the shit out of it. Yeah. Because, because the, the, the audience, and this is not to put down the audience, but the, oh, the people that are financing it, they're dumb to what you're doing they they have they're ignorant they're clueless to what the film is about so having that packaging it's funny because someone actually recently told me that too is to create the lookbook and to have um and when i created the lookbook i just you know when, when i did that i started with you know just putting uh, people that i potentially want to act in this and the story and just some photos that i'd taken in they were like, no, you know, you have the look of the film that you wanted. Sure. Because I never taught, done a lookbook before, but they said, you know, have the look of the film. Um, th you know, talk about like use visuals that talk about the emotion or display the emotion that comes that's supposed to be coming out of your film. You know, that it's supposed right. to be a visual representation of what you're planning to shoot. Right. And it might be that you do multiple versions of that. You might do a version of it. There's, there's, pro there's, there's obviously a version of your lookbook that is a selling lookbook in the sense that, okay, that's the one, uh, that's, that's the one that you, you, uh, you, it's a shorter, like punchier thing. And you, you know, you, you show that to people who you're trying to get, give a sense of the movie you're trying to sell to. Once you get the money, you go into production, you need a more extensive lookbook to hand out to your keys to know, okay, here's what, here's the kind of movie we're all trying to make. Right. No, that's uh, that, that that's totally an eye opener, man. I mean, it's funny because these these things are such basic things, but a lot of us don't think about this. Like, and keep in mind, like these are the things that I have worked with. It, there, there's a thousand, there's many ways to do things. It doesn't always mean there's one way to do this. It just this happens to be the way that I've done it, and it seems to work somewhat for me, although mm -hmm. only somewhat. Well, look here. Here's a fact. Here's the thing. You've you've made two films that the world uh, that the world is viewing. You know, I mean, they're out there in the universe. You know, I mean, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see you, you know, do like a big tentpole film. But at the same time, it's like in comparison, you're light years ahead to everybody else that's, um, you know, that's in this hustle, you know, because I mean, most of us are, are relegated to commercial, corporate, you know, even weddings, for example, you know, we, we do these odd jobs and with our filmmaking gear, with our filmmaking talents to make ends meet. But, you know, all, all of us want that to be able to say, hey, we can, you know, here are our films. Whether they're good or bad, just having films under your belt is, you know, to hear from someone that's already got that out there in the in the universe is just, it, it is so eye-opening because that's actionable intel, you know? It's not just, you know, woo, oh man, just get your art out there and, you know, the world will see it, you know? Because that's the thing. So much of the education out there for independent filmmakers is very just, hey, just keep hustling, keep doing it, keep just, you know, trying to truck along. But it's, it is a lot of technicality behind it too sure you know so i mean you're you're also an educator so i mean that it comes out especially when you're explaining everything and you you teach cinematography mainly correct mm -hmm. so as an educator what is the best advice you could give to first-time filmmakers who are 
trying to get out there and make their first feature? Like what? Uh, have a better script. Have a better script. Okay. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read your script yet, but I'm still going to say that. Have a better script. Right. Because <laughs> 95% <laughs> of the time, I'm right. <laughs> so when do you know when do you know you have a great script? Uh, when people call you after they've read it. Huh. Or it's, 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 there's an old adage in the industry that you know you have great material when you stop chasing talent and talent starts chasing you. Got it. On, on the small level, it is, it is just like I said, if you hand it to friends and they're reluctant and they, and they don't give you feedback or their feedback is very simple uh-huh. and they didn't say, wow, I really like that. Like they have to really be, you have to start to be honest about it. And some of it is just recognizing in your own head. I think many, read a bunch of scripts that are good. You can get them online. They're easy to do. You can get all the all the Academy Award winning scripts. You can get them all online and read them all. And you'll get a sense of what makes a good script. Uh, if you can read it before you watch the movie, even better. But if not, fine. But you'll start to see what a good script is. And if, if you can't then also begin to recognize where yours is or is not falling in there, it's you need to start reading more scripts. You need to get better <laughs> at that. You start recognizing what makes that. It's sort of like on some level, it's kind of like being a chef. You... I can tell you what the ingredients are, but you can't. But but that's my ingredients. You have to be able to add and taste, add and taste, add and taste, and have a sense of what you're going for. But first, you got to know what the hell you're making. You know, if you're making if you're making red curry and you're adding you're adding you know chocolate, well, you're probably fucking up. So you need to, you need to figure out. You know, you need to know. Don't just add everything good you've seen before, and then you have like an avocado avocado salmon orange smoothie. Those are all delicious <laughs> on their own, but yeah. together they suck. So right. you have to recognize that it is it is an important concept to be able to to understand and recognize good material, and it starts with reading more of other people's good material, and then giving giving yours out to people and saying, "How is it working?" Okay, thank you for reading that. I will take your I will take that advice. And when you get notes from people, shut the hell up, just mm-hmm. listen, because otherwise, if you if you're combative about them, a it's their opinion. You can't you can't say no to that. B, right. they're never going to read you again because they're annoyed at having to tell you what they think. Right, be, right. Be, be gracious and say, thank you so much. Can I, can I take you out to lunch for that or whatever? Know what you're asking people. A feature, a feature read is not easy. It's yeah. Not, oh, just give it a quick read. Really? When's the last time you quickly read 120 pages and then made <laughs> extensive notes about it? It ain't that easy. And if you do it for a living, it's expe- especially hard. You're basically asking me to do my job for you for free. Right, right. It's funny because I've been reading a, a lot of scripts lately. Just um, you know, just just to concept get get con, you know, like I've been reading, actually taking them offline. So and people have submitted them, and I've just been like, wow, how are these people writing this? You know, I mean, but then you know they're out there, they're putting their work out there, they're getting critiques, you know, and it's actually at least teaching me, you know, what not to write. I recently, as a side note, just pre-ordered the uh, the Parasite uh, storyboard book. So I'm curious if they I think they're going to translate a, a screenplay with that too. So I'm curious to see that screenplay when it comes out because I, I think the Korean screenplay is out. But you can get you can get you can get access to the blacklist scripts from the last from the every everything but the current year. Huh. Read those. Those haven't okay. been produced mostly. Where do you get and those? Then, so the way the places that I found them best mm-hmm. are Indie Film Hustle. Okay. Oh, Indie Film Hustle. Yep. Yeah. So they have the blacklists. All the all they do the you can get access to blacklists from the latest one I see here is 2016. Hmm. Um, there might be some other ones later on the on, on different ones, but that's but at least you can read a lot of the blacklist scripts going back all the way to 2007. You just get access to the database as a Google to Google Drive, and you can hmm. start reading a bunch of stuff. Hmm. And that that at least helps you see things that are considered good. They're not always. I mean, I read a lot of blacklist stuff. I'm like, how the fuck this getting the blacklist? This is terrible. Right. <laughs> um, but it doesn't matter. It's like that someone thought it was good, and that's kind of what you have to you have to start looking at and going, why do I think people voted for this? Why do people like this? Right. Because uh, they do. They, they think, and a lot of them are true stories. A lot of them are. What you'll find is that for the most part, they have a point of view and there are characters that are different and interesting in the sense that it's not just a normal guy, or if it is, it's a normal guy in extraordinary circumstances. I hear so many people saying, oh, he's just a normal guy. It's okay, so what, what am I watching? Then? What's interesting? And there's something that they want and there's something in their way. It's very basic. It's basic storytelling. It is the idea that you have to have a goal and something has to stop that goal. And the way that you create character-based action is how does your guy get around that goal in a different, in an interesting way. That's not what everyone would do. Right. And don't make it easy. If it's easy, we're done in 10 minutes and we go home. <laughs> that's the hero's journey, right? Yeah. 
So is that something that all the scripts require? Because, I mean, you think about it, is, doesn't that make everything almost the same type of story, but a different... Uh, you mean conflict? N- well, in the sense that, like, if every if every script format's the same, because I, I see a lot of people always uh, do the whole Save the Cat style script now. Sure, sure. Is Does that kind of make all the content the same at some point? Or, I, I mean, is there a fear of that happening? I don't think so, because I think it's been going on since the Greeks. I mean, you look at, I mean, Hamlet has a, a three-act structure. It just right. it, 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 it's put into five acts, the way, they, way, he, way that Shakespeare did it. It's not like it's unheard of, and it's it's more that it's it's been sort of time-honored and works. It doesn't mean you have to, again, I'm not a huge fan of Save the Cat. I do think that becomes formulaic, but there is right. a point of dramatic tension, rising drama, the ability to say when is the when is this story really starting and what is it? Mm-hmm. Uh, the ability to say what is the what is a way that kicks us into this thing and you know, that that is interesting. I mean, you know, on the the big scale, you look at something like Avengers and the game, where mm-hmm. you know everyone thinks, oh, it's about you know once they find find you know once they find him and they kill him, it'll be over. Well, no, that was the first sequence. That was the beginning of the movie. It wasn't until they realize and, and and basically you want to you want to make it hard. You want to completely you want to beat your characters up. Uh-huh. So I think the thing that is I often see as problems is not formulaic. I mean, God, you'd be better off being formulaic. Right. Is that you people try so hard to veer from the formula that they lose the things that make the formula good, which are conflict, which mm. are a, a rising sense of action, which are inc- which are actions and reactions that build upon themselves as opposed to simply going, okay, now a random thing happens and now another random thing happens, but they're not connected to the rest of it. And so I could have I could have seen twenty instead of you know before scene 30 or vice versa and it wouldn't matter well that's that's a bad script something's wrong if 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 there's not a progression of conflict and the idea that we, we that your character doesn't want anything and nothing opposes him well then what's going on i mean okay fine if you can do that fine but even within you know you know there there every great script has some level of conflict that way because there's something that someone wants and there's a problem with that hmm. what what is your favorite script Oh God, I don't know. There's so many of them for so many different reasons. I mean, I, I you know, I, I've, I, I like reading a lot of, you know, I mean, the, 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 if you read Shane Black's old stuff, it's really fun to read. I don't always like the movies, but like Lethal Weapon, it's fun read, you know, because he's, you know, because he was, he was the first guy to kind of add in flavor to the scripts when everyone else kind of made it dry. So that's always interesting. Although he did screw up the Predator, which I'm really upset about. <laughs> Again, I don't think it's entirely him, but sure. <laughs> true, true. What is the one film that you tend to go back to a lot and rewatch over and over again that you can't get enough of? I mean, there's so many of those. I mean, I, I you know, you could all, you could say anything from Die Hard to Ghostbusters to No Country for Old Men. Like mm. all these are movies that you watch for different reasons. I mean, I can, I can watch Sicario over and over for the cinematography. Right. Um, the opening but i do think it sort of slows down the middle but you know and it's got a weird switch where suddenly it's a different person's movie Mm -hmm. and but that all is interesting so it's it's kind of like you you watch them for different things Hmm. you know i'm i'm on a journey i want to make my feature film i want to make feature films i i i want to die at least having been a a proper filmmaker you know that's that and and that's what something that i want to help impart to other people and i mean i look at you and i look at nick you know all the all the guys that you know that i've that I admire and, you know, totally idolize because you guys are doing it, you know, you're teaching it, you're living this every day. It's not just you, that you guys are, you know, working a restaurant job or anything like that. You guys are living film every day. And that's something that I totally appreciate. So, you know, thank Nothing you for doing working a restaurant job though. Sorry? Nothing wrong with working a restaurant job though, where you, get, where you, where you, where you work on, as long as you're still working, trying to write. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with working, but it's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost riskier to be a filmmaker or an actor or anything and just do that, you know? It is. It is. It, it, it can also be a little, sometimes it can be a little siloing in the right. sense that you, you stop looking at what is outside of, of the stuff that is interesting to film people. So, so you do have to live a little bit and read and, you know, I always find it interesting that I watch so many film students who can never get off their phone and only walk in and walk around with their headphones on and they never listen to the world or watch the world or eavesdrop on people. And I'm always like, how do you, you have to recreate life. How are you going to do that if your entire life is scored by your phone and you always have input coming in? If it's all input in, there's never output out. You never have room for your thoughts. 
uh, at some point in time, you got to put aside the the entertainment tools and just listen. Because at the end of the day, no matter what you're doing, no matter whether you're making a Marvel movie or whatever, you'll it's about people. It's about the humanity and the people involved in the characters. That's what makes people interested. Everyone thinks, oh, it's about the effects. It's really not. It's you know, of course, those are big and those have to be huge and for like something like a Marvel movie. But but at the end of the day, the questions you'll get from a studio or from anybody are. Who are these people and why do we care about them? Now, sometimes those notes are over, overdone and they're a little silly and formulaic. And that's true. But it doesn't mean they don't, carry, they don't carry a burden of reality, which is that you do have to pay attention to the why. Right. Why is it happening now? Why do we care? Why are they doing it? Why? Why, 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 why? Hmm. I love that, man. I freaking love that. I could just, you know, honestly, I could just sit here and listen to you all night. But I do want to ask you, what's next for Mr. Conan? Well, uh, my brother and I are heading to Spain very soon. A movie that we wrote is in production, is in prep there, and they want oh. us to be out there when they start production to be able to do any tweaks as necessary. Congratulations! We have a movie that thank you. We have a movie that we wrote that a, uh, a friend of ours is going to be directing that we are producing and I'm shooting. Mm, wow. And then another one that I'm ho- that hopefully we're going to be di- doing here in the late fall huh. that I will be direct. It's a smaller one, but that is awesome. Yeah. Well, if 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 you need if you need any hands on set, let me know. I will let you know. Uh anything that you want to just throw in there real quick before we sign off? Uh no, I would just say don't uh don't try to compete with the big guys on the look of your movie. It's not going to happen. Stop trying. You don't have Marvel money, and that's mostly how they do it. Mm-hmm. Think about what makes you about what's interesting. When people say write about write what you know, it doesn't mean write your life because no one's life is that interesting. Usually, start to finish. <laughs> it means write about the relationships you know. If you have, if you had a, a a strange or interesting relationship with a father, or an uncle, a brother, that's a relationship you mind. The reality of that. If you know somebody, you know, think of, write about the people in your life who are interesting to you and not just like who are accomplished. Sometimes people who are not accomplished. Sometimes it's, I ask people to describe their worst relative and why and let them talk about that. Cause that, that person is interesting in some way to them because I, they describe them in a way, but be, be willing to mine your own life a little bit and be open and honest and real and, and self-reflective because if you if you don't want to do the work, if you don't want to sit down and write, or you you want to write something about your life, but you don't want to hit the the dirty parts of it, that's not going to work. Most that's what people want is the dirty parts. They want to hear the parts that are that where things went wrong. So that's what I would say. Don't make it easier on your characters, and don't make it easy on yourself. Oh man, that's that's just freaking amazing. And with that, Matt, thank you for doing this. Thank you for spending this hour with me and our listeners. And I can't wait to follow up to see how your um, the 2020 goes with all your film production. And hopefully I get to do this again with you, man. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Sydney Hustle is written and produced by me, Vin Chandra. Our audio engineer and editor is Joshua Montmany. You can find us at youtube.com forward slash Vinchandra or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do here, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell and leave a comment below. Thanks for listening.